Thousands of people have mobilised in Cochabamba to mark Bolivia's Plurinational State Foundation Day. Members of the migrant caravan returned to Honduras after being denied safe passage by authorities. And Chinese officials continue working to contain the outbreak of a new coronavirus-related pneumonia that has left at least 17 people dead and infected over 500. From the headquarters of Telesur English, this is from the South, I'm Katrina Goss. Thousands have mobilised in Cochabamba to mark Bolivia's Plurinational State Foundation Day. Citizens are gathering in Sona Sur to watch a live broadcast by President Morales from Argentina. Celebrated since 2010, January 22nd marks a day of triumph for full Bolivia's various indigenous and rural communities after decades of social struggle. This year's celebration is especially significant as it's the first since the military-backed coup that ousted President Evo Morales. More than two months since the coup against President Evo Morales, Bolivia's Legislative Assembly finally accepted the President and Vice President's resignations. Let's take a look at the details. Against all logic, a legislative minority that was part of the coup against the ousted President and Vice President tried everything in their power to prevent the Assembly from accepting their resignations. Their resignation letters are completely extemporary and untimely. Also against the logic, the majority of the assembly members who are part of Morales' movement towards Socialism Party accepted the resignations. As assembly members, we have functions, and one of the attributions of the Legislative Assembly is to review and debate the resignations of former authorities. As such, we have complied with regulations. The president of the Senate and leader of the mass party provided a justification for accepting the resignations two months and ten days after they were submitted and one day before the end of Morales' constitutional administration. We have prioritized the social stability of Bolivia and the responsibility that this assembly has with the people. President Evo was clearing his resignation. He signed it so that there would be no more debts, so that there is peace, so that our country can see better days. Still, a group of lawmakers from the mass party tried unsuccessfully to reject the resignations. This is a question of honor, a symbolic issue. The Bolivian people vote for Evo Morales. He won the election. And we as representatives of the Bolivian people have taken a decision to reject his resignation. Evo Morales and Álvaro García Linera were forced to resign following a military-backed coup last November after a period of far-right violence that included the kidnapping of officials and their relatives, the burning and sacking of their homes, the destruction of nine electoral courts, and a demand by the police and armed forces for the president to leave. And on Wednesday morning, members of the Honduran migrant caravan that arrived last week in Tecon Uman, Guatemala, returned to Honduras. On Monday, a large group of the over 3,000 migrants who had made the trek north crossed the Sushiat River into Mexico after being denied safe passage by authorities. But the Mexican National Guard eventually detained groups of those who crossed the river and returned them to Guatemala. Reportedly, the Guatemalan government provided them with buses for their journey back home. and over 300,000 people fled Honduras last year, with most of them saying that the economic crisis and rampant violence were their motives for moving. Experts agree Honduras is a prime example of the failure of capitalism and the neoliberal model pushed by Western powers. The migrant caravans started in Honduras at the end of 2017, as numbers for migration and forced displacement raised every day. There is a lot of crime, there is no work. That is why we decide to flee Honduras and look for a better future. A lot of corruption. There is no safe support. Nobody gets any help, much less young people. Look at where we are. We are forced to escape with our families, hoping for a better tomorrow. The number of people who join these caravans rises every year. One of the reasons they do this is to save what they would have to spend on buses and also to face the dangers of the journey as a group. It is the neoliberal policies that have increased exploitation of people and of natural resources. Other countries' immigration policies have also become more hostile. The United States used to stop migrants at the border. Now they don't even 
let them get close to the gate. The crisis grew after 2009, U.S. back coup in Honduras. But even back then, the nation was among the poorest in Latin America. After the coup, agreements with financial institutions opened the doors for powerful neoliberal measures that left the country in shambles. 70% of people in Honduras live under the poverty line, and the numbers grow worse due to a lack of work and social programs, dooming the over 8 million citizens, most of them of working age. Underemployment rates are at 74 percent. These are people with jobs who are not paid well or have a job that pays by the hour. This is the result of the neoliberal policies and have led to the rise in migration. On top of mass migration, there's also been an increase in the criminalization of those less privileged and of minorities, as xenophobia rises. We have seen Donald Trump promote these ideas since his first campaign. He's always had the goal to stop migration towards the U.S. He is supported by hate groups who promote this xenophobic agenda. The Honduran government signed a safe third country agreement last year as part of the anti-immigrant policies of Donald Trump. Through this measure, the U.S. hopes to halt migration to their borders. The U.S. has shown they don't care about international agreements. We can see it in the case of the environment and in the case of accepting refugees. The U.S. has implemented highly racist and hateful rhetoric into their laws. Despite the warnings and restrictions made by the U.S., over the next few days, a new migrant caravan will set off from Honduras. The international anti-imperialist meeting started today in the Venezuelan capital, with the attendance of representatives of social movements and international politicians. The meeting will be structured in thematic workshops to discuss topics like 21st century aggressions of the U.S., the path to a sustainable economic model, and the experiences of progressive governments across the world. Participants will denounce neoliberal and imperialist policies promoted by the United States and its allies. The slogan for life, sovereignty and peace will distinguish the meeting running until January 24th. And Colombian social movements met with heavy police repression on Tuesday as they mobilised against the ongoing murders of social leaders in the country. Police fired tear gas and stun grenades at students, workers and indigenous people who took to the streets of Bogota to demand an end to what they call the government's war policies against indigenous people and Afro-descendants. While the United States praises Colombia as a model for the region, more than 20 social leaders have already been killed this year. Meanwhile, around 150 members of the country's indigenous communities were killed in 2019. According to human rights groups, a number of young protesters have been detained by police in the Suba area of Bogota. The security forces sought to prevent those being arrested from providing their names and identity numbers in order to receive legal assistance. And coming up, the SARS-like virus in China has now killed 17 and has spread to other countries. Don't go away. Welcome back. Chinese officials continue working to contain the outbreak of a new coronavirus-related pneumonia that has left at least 17 people dead and infected over 500. Chinese officials also confirmed that the infection can be passed between humans, adding that the origin of the virus was likely to have been wild animals sold in food markets. First detected in China's central Wuhan city, cases of the respiratory virus have now been detected in other countries, including Thailand, Japan, South Korea and the United States. On Wednesday, officials outlined some of the current measures and future plans to control the spread of the virus. After we initially determined the epidemic pathogen as a new coronavirus, we immediately organized the development of detection reagent box while optimizing the detection scheme, enhancing the search and detection and recheck of cases. Meanwhile, we've been paying close attention to the epidemic situation, amending the relevant preventing methods, adjusting treatment and control measures, and making great efforts to reduce the cases of severe illness and death. 
Based on the measures that have already been taken, we are also enhancing measures on preventing the spread of the epidemic. Those measures include enhancing quarantine and treatment of the cases, closely tracking and observing close contacts, improving the environmental renovation and management of farm produce markets in Wuhan, launching health campaigns, releasing information about the epidemic situation, popularizing knowledge on epidemic prevention and control, and finally conducting body temperature screenings at airports and railways and bus stations. Meanwhile, citizens in Beijing have maintained calm in the face of the new virus, saying they believe that the government is adopting the right measures to stop it from spreading. I only heard about it recently, maybe because of the influence of SARS in the past. The country is paying a lot of attention to this kind of contagious diseases, so they want ordinary people to pay attention to prevention. I think it's the right thing for the government to do. There isn't any problem. Wear a mask, wash your hands more often, and try your best to keep a distance from places with lots of people. In 2019, the Chinese population surpassed 1.4 billion inhabitants. However, birth rates decreased remarkably, posing a challenge to the world's second biggest economy. New figures confirm that China is still the most populated country in the world. In 2019, the Asian giant's population surpassed 1 billion 400 million inhabitants. However, China's birth rate had its greatest decrease in the last 70 years. The living conditions of young people have improved, so they spend more time enjoying their lives and their jobs. Consequently, they aren't having as many children. The birth rate decrease and diminishing workforce due to the high number of elderly people is generating concern for the Chinese authorities regarding social and economic consequences. People don't want to have children because of the high prices of things like housing. Having children is not the first option for young people anymore. There are other priorities. In order to face this problem, in 2016, China abolished the one-child-per-family policy in order to increase the birth rate. However, this measure didn't manage to reverse the trend. Experts have warned about other conditions, such as the high living costs, childcare expenses, labor demands, and the lack of daycare options. Our generation has a huge weight on its shoulders. Our parents are getting older. Our kids are too young. We are still early in our careers. All of these things together could easily undo us. President Xi Jinping's administration considers aging and the low birth rate as key elements for its economic and social agenda. Therefore, he has been implementing measures to face these challenges for the country's future. And India's Supreme Court started hearing petitions against the controversial new citizenship law. Judges deferred the next hearing of the case by five weeks, saying a larger constitution bench would need to consider the request to stop the government from implementing the new act. Human rights organisations and activists are seeking to have the Citizenship Act revoked as they argue that it discriminates against Muslims. Several people have died in nationwide protests since the announcement of the new act late last year. Some part of what the BJP is doing is not necessarily bad. You're regularizing migrants, you're changing the law for them, that's all right. So the Muslims don't say, the minorities don't say, knock them out, right? They say, you've taken them in, you have to take me in as well. Don't not take me in because of my religion. And staying with news related to Asia, in Myanmar, the LGBTQ community has started a campaign to urge political leaders to decriminalize same-sex relationships. Human rights groups have called for the ban on same-sex relationships to be repealed and for a new anti-discrimination law to be enacted. Thousands of people participating in the campaign painted their little fingers pink as they tried to raise awareness ahead of the elections taking place this year. We uh, that we need legal protection, we need legal recognition, and we need legal reform to really recognize and protect the, everyone in the country. The public support towards the LGBTQ community is still too little because schools and many other sectors should have done more. Still, a lot has changed over time. And after this break, protests continue in Lebanon. Stay with us for more.
Welcome back. The Greek Parliament approved today Judge Katerina Sakelaropoulou as the next president of Greece, becoming the first female president of the conservative country, elected with an overwhelming majority in the first round. The new president will take the oath on March 13th, when the term of current president Prokopolis Pavlovas officially ends. The president-elect broke the mould when she became the first woman to lead the country's highest court in October 2018. Sakela Ropolo is also known for her commitment to civil liberties, ecological issues, minority and refugee rights. And residents of Greek islands hosting large migrant camps on Wednesday kicked off a day of protests, demanding the immediate removal of thousands of asylum seekers. Residents on the islands of Lesbos, Samos and Chios staged a general strike, shutting down public services with street demonstrations scheduled later in the day. More than 19,000 asylum seekers are currently residing in the largest camp of Maria on the island of Lesbos, despite its maximum capacity of 2,840. The situation is equally critical on other islands and living conditions have been repeatedly criticised by human rights groups and medical charities. And protesters have started blocking ports as they pile more pressure on the French government over pension reforms. Demonstrators burn debris in front of the entrance to the industrial harbour in Le Havre, preventing lorry drivers from entering. The Federation of Port and Dock Workers, which led the action, intends to block six more French ports until Friday as a new form of protest against the pension reform. And the U.S. Senate adopted rules on Trump's impeachment trial, which gave the White House the right to push a motion to dismiss the case. The organizing resolution adopted by the U.S. Senate early today allows the White House and the president's lawyers to file any motions permitted according to the rules. This Wednesday morning, Republicans turned down a motion to call former National Security Advisor John Bolton, critical of the Ukraine policy, to testify in the trial. And U.S. Senators have rejected an amendment proposed by Chuck Schumer, the leader of the Senate's Democratic minority, aiming to subpoena the White House for documents as part of President Donald Trump's impeachment trial. The amendment proposed by Schumer seeks documents related to a number of topics, including President Trump's request for investigations into Berkeley. former Vice President Joe Biden, communications between top White House officials and the freezing of roughly $400 million to death, in military aid to Ukraine. I send an and Lebanese President Michel Aoun approved a new government coalition led by Hassan Diab, nearly three months after the resignation of former Prime Minister Saad Hariri, due to protests in the country. The new Prime Minister, who served as Education Minister from 2011 until 2014, promised he will do his best to respond to the latest demands of protesters, who have been mobilising since October 17th. The 20-member cabinet will hold its first meeting next Wednesday. The important thing today is to secure the stability that preserves the country in order to begin consolidating the pillars of this stability by restoring the trust of the Lebanese in the state. Therefore, betting on protecting the backs of the Lebanese army and security forces by providing them with the political umbrella that gives them immunity in dealing with challenges with wisdom and distinguishing between protests and riots. And meanwhile, protesters took to the streets of Beirut before the new cabinet was unveiled, resulting in violent clashes between security forces and the demonstrators. Clashes erupted on Wednesday as Lebanon's new government convened a day after it was formed, following a three-month political vacuum. Protesters attempted to rip down barbed wire and threw stones at police, who responded with tear gas and water cannons. Protesters in and around Beirut gathered to denounce the new cabinet, describing it as a rubber stamp for the same political parties they blame for widespread corruption. We are not satisfied with this government. Whomever they were, what would they do? We do not accept this dividing of shares for Lebanon. We will remain on the ground as free, peaceful revolutionaries. We are peaceful revolutionaries and we want a new Lebanon without any corrupt individuals. We want this state to prosecute the corrupt. We don't want a state that laughs at these people by forming a government. We've been waiting for two months for the formation of a government and they're just dividing shares. I was one of the people who supported the formation of a government. We've been in this dark tunnel for three months. The first step to get out of this tunnel that the country has found itself in, as a result of the accumulation of some grown political moves, is to form a government made from certain sects. 
And the Democratic Republic of Congo celebrates on Friday the first anniversary of the inauguration of President Felix Tshisekedi. The first peaceful transition was achieved at the cost of a coalition agreement with his predecessor, Joseph Kabila, weakened by multiple tensions. The first thing I'm proud of about the president is the cancellation of school fees. The second thing is peace in the country. Despite the inflation of the dollar, there is peace. I focus on the speech of the president of the republic. We are at the beginning of the year, so we are waiting. We are patiently waiting for his actions. And we've come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website at tellysirenglish.net. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. For Tellysir English, I'm Katrina Goss. Thank you for watching.